All right, so here is part one of who knows how many parts of the solutions notes. <coughs> Remember, we combine chapters 13 and 14 um, into one nice, neat little chapter. And I'm basically just covering what you need to know out of that chapter for AP. If I don't cover it in here, you don't need to worry about it. So the first four things that I'm going to talk about are the differences between solute and solvent, the types of solution, the differences between a solution, a suspension, and a colloid, and then what it is that makes some real basic information about electrolytes. So first up is the difference between a solute and the solvent. The solute gets dissolved. You can have more than one solute in a single solution, um, and the solvent does the dissolving and you can only have one solvent so like if we had salt water well the thing that gets dissolved the solute would be the salt and the thing that does the dissolving the solvent would be the water what if we had Kool-Aid Kool-Aid the solute the thing that gets dissolved would be the powder and the sugar and the solvent again is water. Um, uh, let's see if we were talking um, air, just atmospheric air. The solvent, in, the easiest way to recognize the solvent is it's the part of the solution that is present in the highest amount. So the air is mostly made up of the solvent which is nitrogen and then the solutes are oxygen uh, you got some co2 in there got some water vapor and then you got you know a few other little tiny amounts minuscule amounts of gases but these are the three main solutes that are in air and when we talk about what kind of solution is it, what type of solution, it's determined entirely by the solvent. So up here, where the solvent was liquid water, that means the solution is a liquid. Here in air, where the solvent was a gas, that means it's a gaseous solution. And you can have a solid solution too. Those are usually made by melting the solids and then mixing the solids and allowing them to solidify. Uh, dental fillings are the old school metal ones. I don't know exactly what the new uh, white, they're not really new, they're like 20 years old, but the, the white dental fillings are made up of, but I know the old school metal fillings are a solution of uh, three or four different metals that the metals are melted, liquefied, and then mixed together and then actually put on your tooth where they solidify and, you know, fill a hole. So, here we go. Suspension, solution, colloid, what's the difference? Well, we just talked about a solution. If you remember this term from way back at the beginning of the year, homogeneous mixture, basically it means that the solute and the solvent, you can't tell the difference between them. You can't look at a glass of Kool-Aid and go, oh, I see there's the sugar and there's the Kool-Aid powder and there's the water. No, because it's all evenly mixed together. And then you have a suspension which is a heterogeneous mixture. Remember, heterogeneous means you can actually see the different parts. And this is where the solute particles, they're either so big or insoluble or some combination of the two that if you just left, like let's say, you know, you had a glass of something, let's say it was OJ, orange juice, and you just left it sitting there, eventually after, you know, a decent amount of time, you're going to have a glass with a liquid in it, but like all of this gunky stuff down here at the bottom. Well, here you would have like orange flavored -y type of water, and down here you would have all the, the orange goo. And even Pulp Free is going to do this, where it separates out like this. Uh, another example would be Italian salad dressing. Anything that on the, the container says shake well before using is going to be some type of suspension. And then you have the, the in-between, a solution and a suspension, and that's your colloid. And this is where the solute particles are big, so you can see them, but they're not so big that they're going to stay, or that they're going to settle out of the mixture. And the really interesting thing about the colloids is that these slightly big particles that stay uh, dissolved in the mixture, they'll scatter light. And so it's really cool. If you think about, like, fog, a cloud in general does this. Is a colloid but fog is one that you know we've actually had 
hands-on experience with. Um, if you shine a flashlight through a fog or like your headlights through a fog, you know that it scatters your headlights to the point that you can't see, which is why you use fog lights. So like if this was your car, here's like the front bumper of your car. Don't laugh at my car. This is the front, I swear. I know it kind of looks like the back. But your fog lights are always down here at the bottom because the idea is, you know, if this is the road, a fog doesn't really reach all the way to the bottom, so the, hopefully the fog lights will cut underneath the fog and you can see. Whereas your headlights, if they shine out into the fog, are going to hit all these little colloid particles and just scatter the light to where you can't see anything. Um, another example of a colloid is jello. It's really kind of interesting if you have jello and you shine a flashlight through the jello, you can actually see the beam of light traveling through the jello. And on your lab day, I'll set up. Um, an example uh, mixture, an example of colloids, so you can actually see this. It's, it's really kind of a neat thing. Oh, and by the way, this thing right here, that where, where they'll scatter light, this is actually, it's got a special name. It's called the Tyndall effect. I guess it's named after some guy, Tyndall, who discovered this thing. I don't know. I don't know who Tyndall was. I did not meet him. But that's what this is called. It's called the Tyndall effect, whenever a colloid scatters light. All right, electrolytes. This is any solution that is capable of conducting electricity. And yeah, I know you, as soon as you hear the word electrolytes, you're thinking, oh, that's like Powerade or Gatorade or something like that. Yes, those are examples of electrolytes. But all that it is, Gatorade and Powerade are both solutions that are capable of conducting electricity. Their purpose is to replenish the electrolytes that you lose whenever, you know, you, you sweat like crazy during exercise, your sweat contains salts. Basically, electrolytes are just dissolved salts that ionize. And so as you sweat, you lose those salts and you have to replenish them. A sports drink will not give you energy. It will not make you run farther, faster, or harder. It just replenishes electrolytes. You could get the exact same result from drinking a little bit of salt water. Uh, or pickle juice, as I learned that the football players do. Interesting stuff. Uh, and the reason that electrolytes can conduct electricity is because they contain these salts that ionize. It's the ions. The ions are the big part of this. They're the things that are capable of carrying the electrical signal through the solution. If you don't have ions, you don't conduct electricity, period, end of story, which is why pure water distilled water does not conduct electricity, whereas like pool water or tap water would because pool water and tap water both have dissolved ions in them. Right, so how do you make a solution? Well, whenever you make a gas solution, all you got to do is mix the two gases together and they will naturally mix on their own through the process of uh, diffusion. Something we diffusion. Something we talked about in the last chapter. Two solids to make a solution, you just have to melt down the two solids, mix them together, and let them harden back up in their solution. But whenever you're making a liquid solution, if you have two liquids mixing together, you know, they mix together pretty easily, just stir them together. But there are special conditions for dissolving a solid in a liquid and dissolving a gas in a liquid. And if you think about it, these make sense. If you heat a solution, the solid will dissolve faster. If you stir it, the solid will dissolve faster. And in a way, this is just a more specific form of this. Because when you heat something, your particles get moving faster, which means you have higher motion. Um, and then a smaller solute size. So if you took, like, let's say you're trying to dissolve like a bouillon cube or something like that. Uh, if you took that bouillon cube and crushed it up before you added it in, then it would dissolve more quickly. And then you have the flip side of that where you're trying to dissolve a gas in a liquid. And of course, the quintessential example of this is soda. Another example of this would be um, the oxygen that's dissolved in lakes and rivers that the fish actually use to breathe. Um, so a low temperature is why we keep our sodas in the fridge. A high pressure is why we keep our sodas closed when we can, and little or no motion is why you don't shake a soda up unless you want all the gas to come out and for it to go flat. Uh, three terms for saturation. You've got unsaturated, saturated, and super saturated. And unsaturated, more solute could dissolve. So um, if you were making uh, Kool-Aid and you, well okay, Kool-Aid is not a great example. 
the lab that we did last week where you made the saturated salt solution by, I told you just to take a whole bunch of salt, add it to the test tube, and then pour your water over it and then shake until it stopped dissolving. Well, if you didn't add enough on that first step and all of your salt dissolved, you came and said, hey, Miss Harlan, what do I do? I said, hey, add more because you're unsaturated. You can dissolve more salt into that solution. And for the rest of the definitions of saturation, you're going to have to watch the next one.